So, um, welcome. Uh, practical deep learning for coders, lesson one. Um, it's kind of lesson two because there's a lesson zero, and lesson zero is, is why do you need a GPU and how do you get it set up? So if you haven't got a GPU running yet, uh, then go back and do that. Make sure that you can access a Jupyter Notebook and, um, and then you're ready to start the real lesson one. So if you're ready, um, you will be able to see something like this. Um, and uh, in particular, hopefully, you have gone to Notebook Tutorial. It's at the top. That's why I put a zero, zero here. Um, as this grows, you'll see more and more files. But we'll keep Notebook Tutorial at the top. And you will have used your uh, Jupyter Notebook to add one and one together, getting the expected result. Um, let's make that a bit bigger. Uh, and hopefully, you've learned these four keyboard shortcuts. Um, so the basic idea is that uh, your Jupyter Notebook um, has pros in it. Um, it can have pictures in it. It can have charts in it. Um, and most importantly, it can have code in it. Okay. So the code is in Python. Um, how many people have used Python uh, before? So nearly all of you. That's great. Um, if you haven't used Python, that's totally okay. okay? Um, it's a pretty easy language to pick up. But if you haven't used Python, this will feel a little bit more intimidating because the code that you're seeing will be unfamiliar to you. Um, yes, Rachel? I was going to say, for people in the room, it's okay if they don't feel like they're going to Python. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, because I... Trying to keep them both separate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, now that we're here, I'll edit this bit out. So, um, as I say, there are uh, things like this where people in the room, in person, this is one of those bits where it's like this is really for the MOOC audience, um, not for you. Uh, that's. I think this will be the only time like this in the in the lesson um, where we've assumed you've got this set up. Um, thanks for the reminder. Okay. Um, all right, so yeah, for, for those of you in the room or on, or on Fast.ai Live, um, you can go back after this and make sure that you can get this running using the information in course v 3fastai um, Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, a Jupyter Notebook um, is um, a really interesting device for a data scientist because it kind of lets you run interactive experiments um, and it lets us give you not just a static piece of information, but it, let it, it lets us give you something that you can actually interactively experiment with. So let me explain how we think works well to use these notebooks and to use this material. And this is based on the kind of last three years of experience we've had with um, the, the students who have gone through this course. Um, first of all, uh, it, it works pretty well just to watch a lesson end to end. Right? Um, don't try and follow along because it's not really designed to go at a speed where you can follow along. It's designed to be something where you just take in the information, you get a general sense of all of the pieces, how it all fits together. Right? Um, and then you can go back and go through it more slowly, pausing on, in the video uh, and trying things out, uh, making sure that you can do the things that I'm doing um, and that you can try and uh, extend them to do it things in your own way. Okay? So don't worry if things are zipping along uh, faster than you can do them. That's normal. Um, also, don't try and stop and understand everything the first time. If you do understand everything the first time, good for you. Um, um, but most people don't, particularly as the lessons go on, they get faster and they get more difficult. Okay. Um, so at this point, we've got our notebooks going. Uh, we're ready to start doing deep learning. And so the main uh, thing that hopefully you're going to agree at the end of this is that you can do deep learning, regardless of who you are. And we don't just mean do, we mean do at a very high level. We mean world-class practitioner level deep learning. Okay. So um, your main place to be looking for things is course v3.fast.ai. 
uh, where you can find out uh, how to get a GPU, um, other information, and um, you can also access our forums. Um, you can also access our forums, and on our forums you'll find uh, things like how do you um, uh, build a, um, uh, a deep learning box yourself, and that's something that you can do after, you know, later on once you've kind of got going. Um, who am I? Um, so why should you listen to me? Uh, well, maybe you shouldn't, but I'll try and justify why you should listen to me. Um, uh, I've been doing stuff with machine learning for over 25 years. Um, I started out in management consulting, where actually initially I was, I think, McKinsey and Company's first analytical specialist and went into general consulting. Uh, ran a number of startups for a long time. Uh, eventually became um, uh, the president of Kaggle. Um, but actually, the thing I'm probably most proud of in my life is that I got to be the number one uh, ranked contestant in Kaggle competitions globally. Um, so I think that's a good uh, kind of practical, like, can you actually train a predictive model that predicts things? Pretty important uh, aspect uh, of data science. Um, I then founded a company called Enlytic, which was the first uh, kind of medical deep learning uh, company. Um, Nowadays, I'm on the faculty at University of San Francisco and also co-founder with Rachel of uh, FastAI. Uh, so I've, 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 I've used machine learning throughout that time, and I guess I'm, I'm not really, although I am at USF at a university, I'm not really an academic type. I'm much more interested in, in, in using this tool to do useful things. Um, specifically, uh, through FastAI, we are trying to help people use deep learning to do useful things through um, creating software uh, to make deep learning easier to use at a very high level, through education, such as the thing you're watching now, through research, which is where we spend a very large amount of our time, which is researching to figure out how can you make deep learning easier to use at a very high level, which ends up in, as you'll see, in the software and the education, and by helping to build a community which is mainly through the forums, so that uh, practitioners can find each other and work together. So that's what we're doing. Um, so this lesson, Practical Deep Learning for Coders, is kind of the starting point in this journey. Uh, it contains seven lessons. Each one's about two hours long. We're then expecting you to do about eight to 10 hours of homework during the week. Uh, so it'll end up being something around 70 or 80 hours of, of work. Um, I will say it varies a lot as to how much people put into this. Um, I know a lot of people who, who work full-time on Fast AI. Um, some folks who do the two parts can spend a whole year doing it really intensively. Uh, I know some folks watch the videos on double speed and never do any homework and come at the end of it with you know, a general sense of what's going on. So there's lots of different ways you can do this. But if you follow along with this kind of 10 hours a week or so approach for the seven weeks, by the end, you will be able to build an image classification model on pictures that you choose um, that will work at a world-class level. You'll be able to classify text, uh, again, using um, whatever data sets you're interested in. You'll be able to make predictions of kind of uh, commercial applications like uh, sales. You'll be able to build recommendation systems such as the one used by Netflix. Not toy examples of any of these, but actually things that can uh, come top 10 in Kaggle competitions, that can beat everything that's in the academic community, uh, very, very high level versions of these things. So that might surprise you that you know, the, the, the prerequisite here is um, uh, literally uh, one year of coding and high school math, um, but we have thousands of students now who have done this and shown it to be true. Um, you will probably hear a lot of naysayers, uh, less now than a couple of years ago than we started, but a lot of naysayers telling you that you can't do it, uh, or that you shouldn't be doing it, or that deep learning's got all these problems. Uh, it's not perfect, but these are all things that people claim about um, deep learning, which are either pointless or untrue. Um, it's not a black box. As you'll see, it's really great for interpre interpreting what's going on. It does not need much data for most practical applications. You certainly don't need a PhD. Rachel has one, so it doesn't actually stop you from doing deep learning if you have a PhD. Uh, I certainly don't. I have a philosophy degree and nothing else. Um, it can be used very widely for lots of different applications, not just for vision, which is where it's most well known. 
You don't need lots of hardware. You know, that uh, 36 cent an hour server is more than enough to get world-class results for most problems. Um, uh, it's true that maybe this is not going to help you to build a sentient brain, um, but that's not our focus. Okay, so um, for all the people who say deep learning is not interesting because it's not really AI, not really a conversation that I'm interested in, we're focused on solving interesting real-world problems. Um, what are you going to be able to do by the end of lesson one? Uh, well, this was an example from Nikhil, who's actually in the audience now because he was in last year's course as well. Um, uh, this is an example of something he did, which is he downloaded uh, 30 images of um, people playing cricket and people playing baseball and ran the code you'll see today and built a um, nearly perfect classifier of which is which. Um, so this kind of, it's kind of stuff that you can build with some fun hobby examples like this or you can try stuff, as we'll see, uh, in the workplace that uh, could be of direct commercial value. So this is the idea of where we're going to get to by the end of lesson one. We're going to start by looking at code, uh, which is very different to many of the academic courses. So for those of you who have a, kind of an engineering or math or computer science background, this is very different to the approach where you start with lots and lots of theory and then eventually you get to a postgraduate degree and you finally are at the point where you can build something useful. Um, we're going to learn to build the useful thing today. Okay. Now that means that at the end of today, you won't know all the theory. Okay. There, there will be lots of aspects of what we do that you don't know why or how it works. That's okay. You will learn why and how it works over the next seven weeks. Um, but for now, we found that what works really well is to actually get your hands dirty coding not focusing on theory, because there's still a lot of artisanship in deep learning, unfortunately. It's still a situation where people who are good practitioners have a really good feel for how to work with the code and how to work with the data, and you can only get that through experience. And so the best way to get that, that, that feel of how to get good models is to create lots of models, do lots of coding, and study them carefully. And it's uh, Jupyter Notebook provides a really great way to study them. So let's try that. Um, let's try getting started. Right? So to get started, you will open your um, Jupyter Notebook and you'll click on Lesson 1. Lesson 1, Pets. And it will pop open looking something like this. And so here it is. So you can um, run uh, a cell in a Jupyter Notebook by clicking on it and pressing Run. But if you do so, everybody will know that you're not a real deep learning practitioner, because real deep learning practitioners know the keyboard shortcuts. And the keyboard shortcut is Shift-Enter. Given how often you have to run a cell, don't be going all the way up here, finding it, clicking it, just Shift-Enter. Okay, so type, 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 Shift-Enter, type, 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 Shift-Enter. Uh, up and down to move around, to pick something to run, Shift-Enter to run it. Okay. So we're going to go through this quickly, and then later on, we're going to go back over it more carefully. So here's the quick version to get a sense of what's going on. So here we are in lesson one, and these three lines is what we start every notebook with. Um, these things starting with percent are special directives to Jupyter Notebook itself. They're not Python code. They're called magics, uh, which is kind of a cool name. And these three directives, the details aren't very important, but basically it says, hey, if somebody changes the underlying library code while I'm running this, please reload it automatically. If somebody asks to plot something, then please plot it here in this Jupyter Notebook. So just put those three lines at the top of everything. The next two lines load up the FastAI library. Um, what is the FastAI library? So it's a little bit confusing. FastAI with no dot is the name of our software, and then fast.ai with the dot is the name of our organization. So if you go to docs.fast.ai, this is the FastAI library. Okay, we'll learn more about it in a moment, but for now, just realize everything we are going to do is going to be using basically either FastAI or the thing that FastAI sits on top of, which is PyTorch. PyTorch is one of the most uh, popular uh, libraries for deep learning in the world. Um, it's a bit newer than TensorFlow, uh, so in a lot of ways it's more modern than TensorFlow. Um, uh, it's 
extremely fast growing, extremely popular, and we use it because uh, well, we used to use TensorFlow a couple of years ago, and we found we can just do a lot more, uh, a lot more quickly with PyTorch. Um, and then we have this software that sits on top of PyTorch and lets you do far, far, far more things, far, far, far more easily than you can with PyTorch alone. So it's a good combination. We'll be talking a lot about it. But for now, just know that you can use FastAI by doing two things. Importing star from FastAI and then importing star from FastAI dot something, where something is the application you want. And currently FastAI supports four applications, computer vision, natural language text, tabular data, and collaborative filtering. Okay, and we're going to see lots of examples of all of those during the seven weeks. So we're going to be doing some computer vision. At this point, if you are a Python software engineer, you are probably feeling sick because you've seen me go import star, which is something that you've all been told to never, ever do. Okay, And there's very good reasons to not use import star in standard production code with most libraries. But you might have also seen, for those of you that have used something like MATLAB, it's kind of the opposite. Everything's there for you all the time. You don't even have to import things a lot of the time. It's kind of funny. We've got these two extremes of like, how do I code? You've got the scientific com programming community that has one way, and then you've got the software engineering community that has the other. Um, both have really good reasons for doing things. And with the FastAI library, we actually support both approaches. In a Jupyter Notebook, where you want to be able to quickly, interactively try stuff out, you don't want to be constantly going back up to the top and importing more stuff and trying to figure out where things are. You want to be able to use lots of tab complete, be you know very experimental, so import star is great. Then when you're building stuff in production, you can do the normal PEP8 style, you know, proper software engineering practices. So, so don't worry. Uh, when you see me doing stuff which at your workplace is frowned upon, okay, it's, it's, this is a different style of coding. It's not that there are no rules in data science programming, it's that the rules are different, right? When you're training models, the most important thing is to be able to interactively experiment quickly. Okay, so you'll see we use a lot of very different processes, styles and stuff to what you're used to, but they're there for a reason uh, and you'll learn about them over time. Uh, you can choose to use a similar approach or not. It's entirely up to you. The other thing to mention is that uh, the FastAI libraries uh, in a real, designed in a very interesting modular way, and you'll find uh, over time that when you do use import star, there's far less clobbering of things than you might expect. It's all explicitly designed to allow you to pull in things and use them quickly without having problems. Okay, so we're going to uh, look at some data. And there's two main places that we'll be tending to get data from for the course. One is from um, academic data sets. Um, academic data sets are really important, they're really interesting. They're things where academics spend a lot of time curating and gathering a data set so that they can show how well different kinds of approaches work with that data. And the, the idea is they try to design data sets that are challenging in some way and require some kind of breakthrough to, to do them well. Uh, so we're going to be starting with an academic data set called the PET data set. The other kind of data set we'll be using during the course is data sets from the Kaggle competitions platform. Both academic data sets and Kaggle data sets are interesting for us, particularly because they provide strong baselines. That is to say, you want to know if you're doing a good job. So with Kaggle data sets that have come from a competition, you can actually submit your results to Kaggle and see how well would you have gone in that competition. And if you can get in about the top 10%, then I'd say you're doing um, pretty well. For academic data sets, academics write down in papers what the state of the art is. So how well did they go with using models on that data set? Okay. So this is, this is what we're going to do. We're going to try and uh, create models that get right up towards the top of Kaggle competitions, preferably actually in the top 10, not just the top 10%, um, or that meet or exceed academic state-of-the-art published results. Um, so the, um, um, when you use an academic data set, um, it's important to cite it. So you'll see here there's a link to the paper that it's from. You definitely don't need to read that paper right now, um, but if you're interested in learning more about it and why it was created and how it was created, uh, all the details are there. 
Um, so in this case, this is a pretty difficult challenge. Uh, the PET data set is going to ask us to distinguish between 37 different categories of dog breed and cat breed. Um, so that's really hard. Um, in fact, uh, the, uh, every course until this one, uh, we've used a different data set, which is one where you just have to decide is something a dog or is it a cat. So you've got a 50-50 chance right away, right? And dogs and cats look really different, whereas lots of dog breeds and cat breeds look pretty much the same. So why have we changed our data set? We've got to the point now where deep learning is so fast and so easy that the dogs versus cats problem, which a few years ago was considered extremely difficult, 80% uh, accuracy was the state of the art, it's now too easy. Uh, our models were basically getting everything right all the time without any tuning, and so there weren't you know, really a lot of opportunities for me to show you how to do more sophisticated stuff. So we've picked a harder problem this year. So this is the first class where we're going to be learning how to do this difficult problem. And this kind of thing where you have to distinguish between similar categories is called, uh, in the academic context, it's called fine-grained classification. So we're going to do the fine-grained classification task of uh, figuring out a particular kind of pet. And so the first thing we have to do is download and extract the data that we want. Uh, we're going to be using this function called untar data, uh, which will download it automatically, and we'll untie it automatically. Um, AWS has been kind enough to give us lots of space and bandwidth for these data sets, so they'll download super quickly for you. Um, and so the first question then would be, how do I know what untar data does? So you can just type help, and you will find out what module did it come from, because since we imported star, we don't necessarily know that. What does it do? And something you might not have seen before, even if you're an experienced programmer, is what exactly do you pass to it? You're probably used to seeing the names, URL, file name, destination, but you might not be used to seeing these bits. These bits are types, okay? and if you've used a type programming language, you'll be used to seeing them, um, but Python programmers are less used to it. But if you think about it, you don't actually know how to use a function unless you know what type each thing is that you're providing it. So we make sure that we give you that type information directly here in the help. So in this case, the URL is a string, and the file name is either, union means either, either a path or a string, and it defaults to nothing. And the destination is either a path or a string, and it defaults to nothing. So we'll learn more shortly about how to get more documentation about the details of this. But for now, we can see we don't have to pass in a file name or a destination. It'll figure them out for us from the URL. So, and for all the data sets we'll be using in the course, we already have constants defined for all of them, right? So in this uh, URLs module, or class actually, um, you can see ah. that's where it's gonna grab it from, okay? So it's gonna um, download that to some um, convenient path and untar it for us, and we'll then return uh, the value of path. Okay. And then um, in Jupyter Notebook, it's kind of handy, you can just write a variable on its own, right? and semicolon is just an end of statement marker in Python, so it's the same as doing this. You can write it on its own, and it prints it. You can also say print, right? but again, we're trying to do everything fast and interactively, so just write it, and here is the path uh, where it's given us our data. Um, next time you run this, uh, since you've already downloaded it, it won't download it again. Since you've already untarred it, it won't untar it again. So everything's kind of designed to be pretty automatic, pretty easy. Um, there are some things in Python that are less convenient for interactive use than they should be. For example, when you do have a path object, seeing what's in it actually is, takes a lot more typing than I would like. So sometimes we add functionality into existing Python stuff. One of the things we do is we add an ls method to paths. So if you go path.ls, here is what's inside this path. So that's what we just downloaded. So when you try this yourself, um, you wait a couple of minutes for it to download, uh, unzip, and then you can see what's in there. Um, if you're an experienced Python programmer, you may not be familiar with this approach of using a slash like this. Uh, this is a really convenient function that's part of Python 3. It's functionality from something called pathlib. These are path objects. Path objects are much better to use than strings. That lets you basically create subpaths like this. 
doesn't matter if you're on Windows, Linux, Mac, uh, it's always going to work exactly the same way. So here's a path to the images in that data set. All right, so if you're starting with a brand new data set, trying to do some deep learning on it, um, what do you do? Well, the first thing you would want to do is probably see what's in there. So we found that these are the um, uh, directories that are in there. So what's in these images? Um, there's a lot of functions uh, in FastAI for you. There's one called get image files that will just grab a array of all of the image files based on an extension in a path. And so here you can see we've got um, lots of different files. Okay, um, so this is a pretty uh, common way to for image computer vision data sets to get passed around is that there's just one folder with a whole bunch of files in. So the interesting bit then is how do we get the labels? So in machine learning, the labels refer to the thing we're trying to predict. And if we just eyeball this, we can immediately see that the labels are actually part of the file name. You see that, right? It's kind of like path slash label underscore number extension. So we need to somehow get a list of these bits of each file name and that will give us our labels. Because that's all you need to build a deep learning model. You need some pictures, so files containing the images, and you need some labels. So in FastAI, um, this is made really easy. There's a um, object called um, image data bunch, and an image data bunch represents uh, all of the data you need to build a model. And there's basically some factory methods which try to make it really easy for you to create that data bunch. Uh, we'll talk more about this shortly, but a training set and a validation set with images and labels for you. Now in this case, we can see we need to extract the labels from the names. Okay, so we're going to use from name re. So for those of you that use Python, you'll know re is the module in Python that does regular expressions, things that's really useful for extracting uh, text. Uh, I just went ahead and created the regular expression that would extract the label from this text. Okay, so those of you who uh, uh, are not familiar with regular expressions, super useful tool. Um, it'd be very useful to spend some time figuring out how and why that particular regular expression is going to extract the label from this text. Okay. So with this factory method, we can basically say, okay, I've got this path containing images. Uh, this is a list of file names. Remember, I got them back here. This is the regular expression pattern that is going to be used to extract the label from the file name. We'll talk about transforms later. Uh, and then you also need to say, what size images do you want to work with? So that might seem weird. Why do I need to say what size images I want to work with? Because the images have a size. We can see what size the images are. And I guess, honestly, this is a shortcoming of current deep learning technology, which is that a GPU has to apply the exact same instruction to a whole bunch of things at the same time in order to be fast. And so if the images are different shapes and sizes, it can't do that. Right? So we actually have to make all of the images the same shape and size. Um, in part one of the course, we're always going to be making uh, images square shapes. Uh, in part two, we'll learn how to use rectangles as well. It turns out to be surprisingly nuanced. Right? But pretty much everybody in pretty much all computer vision modeling, nearly all of it, uses this approach of square. Um, and 224 by 224, for reasons we'll learn about, is an extremely common size that most models tend to use. So if you just use size equals 224, you're probably going to get pretty good results most of the time. And this is kind of the little bits of artisanship that I want to teach you folks, which is like what generally just works. Okay, so if you just use size equals 224, that'll generally just work for most things most of the time. So this is going to return um, a data bunch object. And in FastAI, everything you model with is going to be a data bunch object. We're going to learn all about them and what's in them and how do we look at them and so forth. But basically, a data bunch object contains uh, two or three um, data sets. It contains your training data. Um, we'll learn about this shortly. It'll contain your validation data. And optionally, it contains your test data. And for each of those, it contains your um, 
uh, your images and your labels, or your texts and your labels, or your tabular data and your labels, or so forth. And that all sits there in this one place. Um, something we'll learn more about a little bit is um, normalization, but generally in all, nearly all machine learning tasks, you have to make all of your data about the same size, specifically about the same mean and about the same standard deviation. Um, so there's a normalize function that we can use to normalize our data bunch in that way. Getting a question. Uh, okay, Rachel, come and ask the question. Come, uh, come over here. Thanks. What does the function do if the image size is not 224? Great. So. Um, this is what we're going to learn about shortly. Uh, basically, this thing called transforms is, is used to do a number of things. And one of the things it does is to make something uh, size 224. Um, let's take a look at a few pictures. Here are a few pictures of things from my data, from my data bunch. So you can see data.showBatch uh, can be used to show me the contents of some of the contents in my data bunch. Um, so this is going to be three by three. Um, and you can see roughly what's happened is that they all seem to have been kind of zoomed and cropped in a reasonably nice way. So basically what it'll do is something called, uh, by default, uh, uh, center cropping, which means it'll kind of grab uh, the middle bit and it'll also resize it. Uh, so we'll talk more about the detail of this because it turns out to actually be quite important. But basically a combination of cropping and resizing is used. Um, Something else we'll learn about is we also use this to do something called data augmentation. So there's actually some randomization in how much and where it crops and stuff like that. Okay, But that's the basic idea is some cropping and some uh, resizing. Uh, often we also uh, also do some, some padding. So there's all, all kinds of different ways and it depends on data augmentation, which we're going to learn about shortly. And what does it mean to normalize the images? So normalizing the images, we're going to be learning more about um, later in the course. But uh, in short, it means that the, the, the pixel values, and we're going to be learning more about pixel values, the pixel values start out from 0 to 255. Uh, and some pixel values might tend to be um, really, um, well, I should say some channels, because there's red, green, and blue. So some channels might tend to be really bright, and some might tend to be really not bright at all, and some might vary a lot, and some might not vary much at all. Um, it really helps train a deep learning model if each one of those red, green, and blue channels has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay? And we'll learn more about that. If you uh, haven't studied or don't remember means and standard deviations, we'll get back to some of that um, later. But that's the basic idea. That's what normalization does. If your data, and again, we'll learn much more about the details, but if your data is not normalized, it can be quite difficult for your model to train well. Um, so if you do have trouble training a model, one thing to check is that you've normalized it. As GPU men will be in power of two, doesn't size 256 sound more practical considering GPU utilization? Um, so we're, we're going to be getting into that shortly, but uh, the brief uh, answer is that the Models are designed so that the final layer is of size 7 by 7. Uh, so we actually want something where if you go 7 times 2 a bunch of times, uh, then you end up with something that's a, a good size. Yeah, all of these details we are going to are going to get to. But the key thing is I wanted to get you training a model as quickly as possible. Um, but, you know, one of the most important things to be a really good practitioner is to be able to look at your data. Okay, so it's really important to remember to go data.showBatch and, and take a look. It's surprising how often when you actually look at the data set you've been given that you realize it's got weird black borders on it, or some of the things have text covering up some of it, or some of it's rotated in odd ways. So make sure you take a look. Okay. Um, and then the other thing we want to look at, do is not just look at the pictures, but also look at the labels. And so um, all of the possible label names are called your classes. That's right? so where the data bunch you can print out your data.classes. And so here they are. That's all of the possible labels that we found by using that regular expression on the file names. And we learned earlier on in that prose I wrote at the top that there are 37 um, possible categories. And so just checking length data.classes, it is indeed 37. Uh, a data bunch will always have a property called C. Uh, and that property called C. The technical details will kind of 
get to later, but for now you can kind of think of it as being the number of classes. Um, uh, for things like regression problems and multi-label classification and stuff, that's not exactly accurate, but it'll do for now. Um, uh, it's, it's important to know that data.c uh, is a really important piece of information that is something like, uh, or at least for classification problems, it is the number of classes. All right, believe it or not, we're now ready to train a model. And so a model is trained uh, in FastAI using something called a learner. And just like a, a data bunch is a general FastAI concept for your data, um, uh, and from there there are subclasses for particular applications, like image data bunch. A learner is a general concept for things that can learn uh, to fit a model, and from that there are various subclasses to make things easier. And in particular there's one called ConvLearner, which is something that will create a convolutional neural network for you. And we'll be learning a lot about that over the next few lessons. Um, but for now, just know that to create a learner for a convolutional neural network, you just have to tell it two things. The first is, what's your data? And not surprisingly, it takes a data bunch. And the second thing you need to tell it is, what's your model? Or what's your architecture? So as we'll learn, there are lots of different ways of constructing a convolutional neural network. Um, but for now, the most important thing for you to know is that there's a particular kind of model called a ResNet, which works extremely well nearly all the time. And so for a while at least, you really only need to be doing choosing between two things, which is what size ResNet do you want? Okay, just basically, how big is it? And we'll learn all about the details of what that means. But there's that one called a ResNet 34, and there's one called a ResNet 50. And so when we're getting started with something, I'll pick a smaller one because it'll train faster. So that's kind of it. That's as much as you need to know to be a pretty good practitioner about architectures for now, which is that there's two architectures, or two variants of one architecture that work pretty well, ResNet 34 and ResNet 50. Start with a smaller one and see if it's good enough. So that is all the information we need to create a convolutional neural network learner. There's one other thing I'm going to give it though, which is a list of metrics. Metrics are literally just things that get printed out as it's training. Uh, so I'm saying, I would like you to print out the error rate, please. Now you can see the first time I ran this on a newly installed box, it downloaded something. What's it downloading? It's downloading the ResNet 34 pre-trained weights. Now what this means is that this particular model has actually already been trained for a particular task. And that particular task is that it was trained on looking at about one and a half million pictures of all kinds of different things, a thousand different categories of things, um, using an image, uh, a data set called ImageNet. And so we can download those pre-trained weights so that we don't start with a model that knows nothing about anything, but we actually start with a model that knows how to recognize the a thousand categories of things in ImageNet. Now, I don't think, I'm not sure, but I don't think all of these 37 categories of pet were in ImageNet, but there were certainly some kinds of dog, and there were certainly some kinds of cat. So this pre-trained model already knows quite a little bit about what pets look like, and it certainly knows quite a lot about what animals look like and what photos look like. So the idea is that we don't start with a model that knows nothing at all, but we start by downloading a model that knows something about recognizing images already. So it downloads for us automatically the first time we use it, a pre-trained model. And then from now on, it won't need to download it again. It'll just use the one we've got. This is really important. We're learning to learn a lot about this. It's kind of the focus of the whole course, which is how to do, this is called transfer learning. How to take a model that already knows how to do something pretty well and make it so that it can do your thing really well. We take a pre-trained model and then we fit it so that instead of predicting the 1,000 categories of ImageNet with the ImageNet data, it predicts the 37 categories of pets using your pet data. And it turns out that by doing this, you can train models in one one hundredth or less of the time of regular model training with one one hundredth or less of the data of regular model training. In fact, potentially, 
many thousands of times less. Remember I showed you the slide of Nikhil's Lesson 1 project from last year? He used 30 images. And there's not cricket and baseball images in ImageNet, right? But it just turns out that ImageNet's already so good at recognizing things in the world that just 30 examples of people playing baseball and cricket was enough to build a nearly perfect classifier. Okay. Now, you would naturally be potentially saying, well, wait a minute, how do you know that it was going to actually, that it can actually recognize pictures of people playing cricket versus baseball in general? Maybe it just learned to recognize those 30. Maybe it's just cheating, right? And that's called overfitting. We'll be talking a lot about that during this course, right? But overfitting is where you don't learn to recognize pictures of, say, cricket versus baseball, but just these particular cricketers and these particular photos and these particular baseball players and these particular photos. We have to make sure that we don't overfit. And so the way we do that is using something called a validation set. A validation set is a set of images that your model does not get to look at. And so these metrics, like in this case error rate, get printed out automatically using the validation set, a set of images that our model never got to see. When we created our data bunch, it automatically created a validation set for us. Okay. And we'll learn lots of ways of creating and using validation sets, but because we try to bake in all of the best practices, we actually make it nearly impossible for you not to use a validation set. Because if you're not using a validation set, you don't know if you're overfitting. Okay? So we always print out the metrics on a validation set, we always hold it out, we always make sure that the model doesn't touch it. That's all done for you. Okay? And that's all built into this data bunch object. So now that we have a conv learner, we can fit it. You can just use a method called fit, but in practice you should nearly always use a method called fit one cycle. We'll learn more about this during the course, but in short, one cycle learning is a paper that was um, released, oh, I'm trying to think, a few months ago, less than a year ago. Um, yeah, so a few months ago. Um, and it turned out to be dramatically better, both more accurate and faster than any previous approach. So again, I don't want to teach you how to do 2017 deep learning, right? In 2018, the best way to fit models is to use something called one cycle. We'll learn all about it, but for now, just know you should probably type learn.fit one cycle, right? If you forget how to type it, you can start typing a few letters and hit tab. Okay, and you'll get a list of potential options. Right? Um, and then if you forget what to pass it, you can press Shift tab, and it'll show you exactly what to pass it. So you don't actually have to type help. And again, this is kind of nice that we have all the types here, because we can see cycle length, and we'll learn more about what that is shortly, is an integer, and then max learning rate, could either be a float or a collection or whatever, and so forth. And you can see that momentums will default to this tuple, um, so on and so forth. Okay, so um, for now, uh, just know that this number four basically decides how many times do we go through the entire data set? How many times do we show the data set to the model so that it can learn from it? Each time it sees a picture, it's going to get a little bit better, but it's going to take time, and it means it could overfit. If it sees the same picture too many times, it'll just learn to recognize that picture, not pets in general. Um, so um, we'll learn all about how to tune this number uh, during the next couple of lessons. Um, but starting out with four is a pretty good start, just to see how it goes. And you can actually see after four epochs, or four cycles, uh, we've got an error rate of 6%. So uh, a natural question is, uh, how long did that took? That took a minute and 56 seconds. Yeah. So we're paying, you know, 60 cents an hour. Uh, we just paid for two minutes of time. I mean, we actually pay for the whole time that it's on and running, but we use two minutes of compute time. And we got an error rate of 6%. So 94% of the time, we correctly picked the exact right one of those 94 dog and cat breeds, which feels pretty good to me. Um, but to get a sense of how good it is, maybe we should go back and look at the paper. Just remember, I said, the nice thing about using academic papers or Kaggle data sets 
is we can compare um, our solution to whatever the best people in Kaggle did or whatever the um, academics did. So this particular data set of pet breeds is from 2012. And if I scroll through the paper, uh, you'll generally find in any academic paper there'll be a section called experiments about two-thirds of the way through. And if you find the section on experiments, then you can find the section uh, on accuracy. And they've got lots of different uh, models. Um, and their models, as you'll read about in the paper, are extremely kind of pet specific. They learn something about how pet heads look and how pet bodies look and, and pet images in general look. And they combine them all together. And once they use all of this complex code and math, they got an accuracy of 59%. Okay, so in 2012, this highly pet specific analysis got an accuracy of 59%. At least were the top researchers from Oxford University today in 2018, with basically, if you go back and look at actually how much code we just wrote, it's about three lines of code. Uh, the other stuff is just printing out things to see what we're doing. We got 94%, so 6% error. So like that gives you a sense of, you know, how far we've come with deep learning, and particularly with PyTorch and FastAI, how easy things are. Yeah. So. Um, before we take a break, I just want to check to see if we've got any... Um, um, and just remember, if you're in the audience and you see a question that you want asked, please click the love heart next to it uh, so that Rachel knows that you want to hear about it. Also, if there is something with six likes and Rachel didn't notice it, which is quite possible, just, just quote it in a reply and say, hey, uh, Rachel, um, this one's got six likes. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a... Uh, Eight minute break, so we'll come back at five past eight. So where we got to was we just we just trained a model. We don't exactly know what that involved or how it happened, but we do know that with three or four lines of code, uh, we built something which smashed the accuracy of the state of the art of 2012. Six percent error certainly sounds like pretty impressive for something that can recognize different dog breeds and cat breeds. Um, but we don't really know why it works, um, but we will. That's okay. Right? And in terms of getting the most out of this course, uh, we very, very rarely hear after the course is finished the same basic feedback, which this is literally copy and pasted from the forum. I fell into the habit of watching the lectures too much and Googling too much about concepts without running the code. At first I thought I should just read it and then research the theory. Okay. And we keep hearing people saying, my number one regret is I just spent 70 hours doing that. And at the very end I started running the code and oh, it turned out I learned a lot more. So please, run the code. Really run the code. I should have spent the majority of my time on the actual code in the notebooks running it, seeing what goes in and seeing what comes out. So your most important skills to practice are learning, and we're going to show you how to do this in a lot more detail, but understanding what goes in and what goes out. So we've already seen an example of looking at what goes in, which is data.showbatch. And that's going to show you examples of labels and images. And so next we're going to be seeing how to look at what came out. Right, so that's the most important thing to study. As I said, the reason we've been able to do this so quickly is heavily because of the FastAI library. Now, the FastAI library is pretty new, but it's already getting an extraordinary amount of traction. As you've seen, all of the major cloud providers either support it or are about to support it. Um, a lot of researchers are starting to use it. It's, it's doing, making a lot of things a lot easier, but it's also making new things possible. And so uh, really understanding the fast AI software is something which is going to take you a long way. And the best way to really understand the fast AI software well is by using the fast AI documentation. And we'll be learning more about the fast AI documentation shortly. So how does it compare? I mean, there's really only one major other piece of software like fast AI that is something that tries to make deep learning easy to use. 
um, and that's Keras. Uh, Keras is a really terrific piece of software. We actually used it for um, the previous courses until we switched to FastAI. Um, it runs on top of TensorFlow. Uh, it was kind of the gold standard for making deep learning easy to use before. Um, but life is much easier with FastAI. So if you look, for example, at the last year's course um, exercise, which is getting dogs versus cats, um, uh, FastAI lets you get more, much more accurate, less than half the error on a validation set, of course. Uh, training 